at, at Matthew 21. This is what's known, uh, if you've been grow, grown up in church at all, uh, you know it as the triumphant entry. And, and if you have your Bible, it probably has it labeled that right above it. And so you can cheat. And even if you haven't been in church, you can just look at your, your page there and it'll tell you. And, and so this is when Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. And uh, this is actually the Sunday, which, which we call Palm Sunday, which was right before uh, the uh, Easter is the week before Easter, and, and so like I said, this is a week leading up, and we're going to look at that. We're going to start at Matthew 21, 1, and Jesus is talking with his disciples, and, and he says, and when, and when they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage at, at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go into the village opposite you, and immediately uh, you will find a donkey tied and a, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has needed them, and immediately he will send them. Okay, we're going to skip down to verse 6. Uh, it says, Then the disciples went, and they did as Jesus had instructed. And they brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their coats on it, and they sat, and he sat on their coats. So they, they kind of made him a little makeshift saddle out of their coats and, and put it on the, the donkey. And he, he got on the donkey, and it says, and, and most of the crowd spread their coats on the road, and others were cutting down branches of trees and, and spreading them across the road. So as he's coming in, to the, the gates and to the streets of Jerusalem, you, you just see this huge crowd just forming and, and they're throwing their coats down and, and throwing these palm branches and, and things down in, in the roadway and, and for, for the donkey to, to kind of walk on as kind of a sign of honor and, and, and to them. And in and, and verse 9 it says uh, the crowds were going ahead of him and, and some of those followed behind him and they were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so here you've got this crowd of people and they, they see Jesus coming in and, and they're, they're all worshiping and they're, they're, they're bowing down and they're throwing these, these uh, the, the, uh, palm branches down and they're, they're throwing their coats down just as an act of worship and they're, they're crying out Hosanna, which I know not everybody grew up in church and stuff and that word just means come save us. And, and so they are literally looking and acknowledging Acknowledging that, that Jesus was going to be their Savior. And, and, and you know, they, they didn't realize he was coming to save them from sin. They thought he was going to come and, and overthrow the Roman government and stuff. And he thought that that was, they thought that was the way he was going to come save us. But how many of you are glad that, that God didn't just set those people free from the Romans, but he set us all free from our sin? Anybody glad that you were set free from your sin? And, and, and so, you know, they're, they're worshiping and they're shouting out, you know, come save us. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And, 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 and it's just this, this awesome time of, of just spontaneous worship and, and people just bowing and, and honoring their king. And then all of a sudden, if you keep reading in Scripture, you fast forward five chapters, six chapters in, in time frame, five days to Friday and you watch it, what changed. In, verse, uh, in Matthew 27, verse 21, this is when Jesus was appearing before Pilate. And, and Pilate didn't find any fault in Jesus. And he was kind of stuck, though, because he knew that if he didn't give the Pharisees and the Sadducees and this crowd what they wanted, then he knew he would have a riot on his hands. And, and, and so this was kind of during a, a Passover time. And, and, and so they were in their, uh, they were, uh, it, it was a time of the year when it was, it was common for them to, to let one prisoner go. And, and so Pilate comes up with this idea because, he doesn't want to have to punish Jesus because he didn't find any fault with him. And that's where we're going to pick us up. 21, it says, But the governor, which was Pilate, said to them, Which of, of, of these two do you want us to release? And they said, Barabbas. And so it's just so you know who Barabbas is, he, uh, uh, Pilate went to the prison and found the, most, the, the worst criminal, the uh, murderer, a thief, a, a, a horrifying man. And, 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 he, and he decided that, that he was going to uh, uh, come up with this idea that he, that he was going to set one person free and he was going to give the people their decision that, that they could either set Barabbas, who was a known murderer and, and, and you know, just this horrible criminal free, or they could set Jesus. And he's expecting expecting that they're going to say, you know, well, set Jesus free because they, they, you know, they're afraid for their lives and they know what Barabbas is like. But listen to their reply. 
And it says they wanted Barabbas. And then, and then Pilate said, then what should we do with this Jesus who is called the Christ? And they all said, crucify him. And he said, what evil has he done? But they, they kept on shouting all the more, crucify him. And so here he is and he's offering them up a, a, a murderer or somebody who five days earlier, they were screaming and rejoicing that he was going to be their savior. And they choose the murderer. And when he asks them, well, what do you want us to do with this, this Jesus, the Christ? He says, I want you to kill him. Crucify him, which was one of the, the worst possible uh, forms of, uh, it, it wasn't just like uh, a firing squad or anything like that that was quick, but it, it, was, it was torture and, and being hung and, and humiliated. They, they not only chose to kill him, but they chose to kill him in one of the most painful, excruciating, humiliating ways. This one that just five days earlier they were looking at as a savior. And so Pilate goes and he, he takes out water and he, he, he washes his hands in front of the crowd and he says, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it that it is on yourselves. And all of the people say, his blood will be on us and his blood will be on our children. Here, the people who were worshiping God and, and throwing their coats out and, and crying out all this blessing and Hosanna and, and all this. They were, they were doing all this just a few days earlier. Now are saying, killing, humiliating, and let it be on us. We'll take, we'll take responsibility for it. And I know some of you, I see the, the look on many faces. It's just like, that's crazy. How could that happen? But if we are completely honest with ourselves, we have done the same thing at one point or another in our life. We have come to church and on Sunday we have sung and, and worshipped God and talked about how great He was and how loving He was and how wonderful He was. And then we get into our week and, and, and come Tuesday we have a rough day and our car breaks down and we're late for work and our boss gets mad at us. And, and, and you know, so we, 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 we have this bad day. And then the same voice that was lifting up and thanking God for His, His, His love and His forgiveness and His grace and stuff is now mad at God and angry at God because their car broke down and because of a situation that's in their life. Or maybe it looks like this. You're, you're here and you're, you're at, uh, at service and, and you're worshiping God with, with, one, with your mouth and then the, the next thing you know, uh, you go to a restaurant and you're yelling at a waitress who messed up your order. Or you're yelling at a hostess because it's taking longer than what you expected. And the same mouth that was speaking worship and praise now is, is, is speaking down to God's children. And speaking down to them. I think it's important for us to realize and, and, and the, the, the power that we have in our tongues for, to bring life and death. You know, the Bible even says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And, and the, the authority and stuff that, that we have. And, and we've got to, to watch this. And, and we've got to make sure that with our tongue, we're not like those people who worship on Sunday, but then come Friday, they're cursing Jesus. And they're, they're, they're speaking death and destruction. And they're, they're speaking all of this to Him. And, and, and you know, it, it, it's amazing at how quickly that our circumstances, that we allow our circumstance to turn our words of worship into words of worry. Our words of faith and, and stuff that we sing in honor to our king in the words of fear. And it's important that as Christians that we begin to control our tongue and line our lives up to where we are consistent that what comes out of our mouth is the same, uh, you know, every day that, that, it, that, it, that, that if we worship God on Sunday, then, then we're worshiping Him on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that, that it is a continual thing that our mouths are, are something that we bring uh, honor and we bring praise to God. But the devil wants to get you to focus on your circumstances and how bad your circumstances are and how big your circumstances are and completely make you miss out on how big your God was and is. 
And I think in, in, in Psalms, you can see, in, in, in Psalms 13, we're, we're going to look at this, but how many of you read Psalms and you're like, well, I've heard you know, David complaining about God and, and complaining about things in his life. And I want to I I show you that. Because see, the problem that we have is we go from worship to worry. But if you look at what David did when he was complaining and, 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 and going through the things that he was going through, he went the exact opposite. He went from worry to worship. And if you look in Psalms 13, verse 1, it says this. It says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will you take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day long? How long will my enemies be exalted over me? Come on, how many of you can relate to that? That in your life at some point or another, it just seemed like that no matter how much you prayed, how much you sought God, that it just was not happening. And, and no matter how much you tried to do right, that, that, that your enemies just seem to be laughing at your face. You know, maybe some of you, it's, it's in your marriage. You're, you're trying to win your spouse over and you're trying to act right and you're trying to do the right thing and, and your spouse just isn't having any part of it and they're, they're making it more difficult or maybe it's in a job situation where you, you have a difficult boss to, to deal with and, and you're trying your best to, to honor him and stuff but he does everything he can to humiliate you and to put you down and to, to make you look like you're less than, than even a human by the way he talks to you. And so you, you felt like that, that your enemies just are, are ruling over you. Let me tell you something. It's okay to have a feeling like that. It's not okay to keep feeling like that. You see, because those thoughts, that's the way the devil comes in and he fights us, is he fights us with our thoughts and with our feelings. And he is going to try to, to get you to, to focus on all these things. He's going to try to get you to move out of emotion. He's going to try to get you to, to just sit there and think about how big your problem is, how horrible your boss is, how disrespectful your kids are. He's trying to make you look at, at the situation and make it bigger. And, and David is not denying that he has a situation going on in his life. He's looking in his circumstances and he's like, hello, God, um, it, it doesn't look like you're anywhere to be here. Uh, my enemies are ruling over me. They're laughing at me. He even goes on in verse 3, it says, consider me and answer me, O Lord. Enlighten my eyes or I'm going to sleep the sleep of death. He's saying, look, if something doesn't change, I'm going to die. I, I, I can't go on living in this situation. And, and a lot of times, David had people out to kill him. I mean, with David, he had King Saul before he was king that was out to kill him. Even when he was king, he had one of his sons that was raising up and, and trying to overthrow him and, and was trying to kill him. I mean, can you, you think about the problems and emotions and stuff that he had. David is not denying that, that there is something going on. And he says, and my enemies will say... I have overcome him, and my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. But then verse 5 starts out with a powerful three-letter word. It starts out with this word, but. Let me tell you something. This is a pretty big but. We talked about it before. Uh, uh, we did a whole series on getting off your butt, uh, being your excuses. And I'm talking about B-U-T, so the, the three-letter word, not the four-letter word, so don't get mad at me now. Don't get all religious on me. But this is a, a, a powerful but here, and this is a good but. It's not a bad but. It's not a, bad, it's not a but that leads him away from God, but this is a but that he looks at the circumstances. Why are y'all laughing? Come on, get your mind out the gutters, people. It's in, it's in Scripture. Come on. This is, this is a, a good but. It, it's changing. He's saying, look at how horrible my circumstances are. I mean, I am going under. Thing. If, if my enemies are laughing at me. This is a bad situation. But. And then look at it. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. And I will sing to the Lord because He has dealt bountifully with me. 
Guys, there, there are buts and there are times when we need to look at our circumstances and not deny that our circumstances exist, but we understand that our God is greater than our circumstances. And we understand that, that the fact that things look bad right now, that our marriage is in, in, in trouble, that our kids aren't acting right, that you don't have a job, that, that your finances are tight, that, that you're in a job that you don't like, no matter what circumstance that you're in. You got a bad negative report from the doctor and, and, and the devil's trying to hit you with fear and, and all of this stuff. But the, the thing that David does here is he looks at his circumstances and he says, I see all of this, but I have a God that is bigger. I have a God who has always been there for me and I'm going to trust that my God loves me because my God loves me so much that he sent his son to a cross and, and, and his son died on a cross and laid down his life willingly out of love for me. And the Bible says that no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for a friend. So if my God loves me that much that he laid down his life for me, then he loves me enough to get me out of this thing. And then instead of getting caught up in the worry and stuff, he said, you know what? I'm just going to sing of God's faithfulness. You know, there's times when you need to just step back and you need to realize that no matter how the circumstances might look bad, they, it, it might look like a rough thing, but God has not changed. But God is still on the throne. And but God is still powerful enough to move. So why are you allowing this to keep you up at night? Why are you allowing this to, to ruin your relationships and the way that you act with people? God is bigger than that. And we need, to, we need to do like David and turn our focus from all of our worries and we need to turn it to worship. I want to talk to you for the next few minutes about the power of our tongue and, and our need to control it. And, and, and the, the ability that we show in controlling our tongue or not controlling our tongue will determine how happy and how peaceful and what type of lifestyle that we live. How effective we are as Christians, how good of parents we are, how good of husbands or wives we are, how good of workers we are, it can all be controlled with the tongue. And in fact, in James chapter 3, uh, at the beginning, the first part of the chapter, he talks about the tongue and he talks about the power of the tongue and how, you know, the, the same way that a, a ship can be turned by a tiny little rudder and a, and a horse can be led by a mouth, uh, by a, a bit in its mouth, that the, the tongue is powerful. But, and James goes on and he talks about this more in James 3, 8. It says, no man can tame the tongue because it is restless and it is evil. It is full of deadly poison. With it, they bless their Lord and Father and they, and they curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. That's that whole thing of uh, you're in here and you're worshiping God and you leave and you go to the restaurant and you speak to the waiter or the, ho uh, the hostess or, or whatever like they're a dog because, because your food didn't come out right. And look what it says. It says, from the mouth, both blessing and cursing, my brethren, things ought not to be this way. You should not be one way in church and then leave and be a completely different way. You should not speak to somebody uh, that, that, that you are a leader over or, or that is a leader over you in, a, in just a respectful way. But then anybody that you are a leader over, you talk to them like they're worthless. Men, you need to watch the way you talk to your wives. Let me tell you something. If you don't treat your wife right, God will get you. God will not listen to your prayers. Read it. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, Men, treat your wives in an understanding way, understanding that they are the weaker vessel, and by, by doing so, your, your prayers will be heard. Or if you don't, your prayers will be hindered. I mean, it tells you. And I can tell you this, as a father, I don't like it when somebody messes with my little girls. And I can just imagine what the Heavenly Father is like. I, just the other day, we're riding down the road, and, and our car was, uh, my, my car, one of my cars is broke down, so we were in two smaller cars, and I'm following behind Melody, and, and her mom, and, and one of my daughters, and Elias were in the front, uh, in the car in front of us, and I'm right behind them, and I look over, and I see this little boy roll down his window, and he's like hanging out the window, yelling at my daughter in the car, and he's like, call me, hey, you fine, and he's like ye ye yelling at her. 
And I'm sitting behind her and, and I'm getting ready. I'm like, if that van pulls off this road, I'm pulling off beside it. And I'm going to go tell that little boy, that ain't the way you talk to my daughter. And I'm going to talk to his parents about the way that they're letting their boy. Because I didn't see them turn around trying to get him to shut up, roll his window up or anything. And they're talking to my daughter in a way that I didn't like. <laughs> and then I had to remind myself, you are a pastor. <laughs> What if she's come to your church before? <laughs> that would not look good. So I just had to just calm down. You know, it's one of those things where the Holy Ghost just kind of speaks to you just to, to calm down and stuff. But, but listen, the way that we talk to people matters. And that's what it says is we should not worship our God and then talk to people down. That's not the way that it's supposed to be. We need to pe treat people with honor and with respect. And many of you, you look at that and it says, well, wait a minute. That verse says that no man can, ta can, can control the tongue or no man can uh, 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 control it. Well, why, how, how can that be if it says that, that no man can do it? You know what? The Bible says there's a lot of things that man can't do without God. Let me show you. There, there's a place in John 4, 6, uh, 14, 6, 14, 6. It's the, same, it's the same word in everything that's used here. And, and Jesus is talking and says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by me. Let me tell you something. You cannot control your tongue but by God. You can't. In yourself, you are going to fail miserably. Those four-letter words are going to keep popping out. That, that, the tone of voice that you don't like is going to keep on going on. But, but with God's help, you can, you can overcome this. And, and that's what we're going to look at is, is how does God help us? How does he help us to, to overcome our, our thing? And in John 14, 16, he, he, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And, and, and he, he tells them, he says, I will ask for the Father and he will give you a helper. And, and that he may be with you forever. You know, you look at the first part, you might be like, well, Jesus isn't here with me. Well, Jesus went to heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, but he sent a helper. And that helper is the Holy Spirit. And that word that the, in the Greek there for, for a helper is parakletos. And that word means uh, to walk by one side or to come alongside. And what that literally means is that God sent His Holy Spirit to walk alongside you in day-to-day -day life to help you, to help you to control your tongue, to help you to say the right things, to help you to, to speak truth and not lies. And we're going to look at, at, at some of those things that the Holy Spirit does. The first one is this, is the Holy Spirit helps us to speak truth. John 15, 26 says this, When the Helper comes, whom I will send uh, you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. And He will testify of me. You even notice it talks about the Holy Spirit, that this, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And, and, and it, this is important because I'm not just talking about not telling lies. Some of you might look at it and be like, well, I don't lie. I'm, I, you know, I, I've got that under control. I know that's one of the Ten Commandments. So, so I, I'm telling the truth. But that's not the truth that this is talking about. This is talking about the same truth as it does in John chapter 8, verse 32. What does it say? It says, and you you will know the truth and what? And the truth will set you free. See, when I'm talking about speaking the truth, I'm not just talking about not telling lies. I'm talking about speaking the truth of God's word. When somebody comes to you and they have a situation or they, they have a circumstance going on in their life and, and you can tell what the area is in their life that, that isn't lined up with God's word and why things aren't working out for them, you speak the truth in love. Why? Because it's the truth that is going to set people free. Let me tell you something. That's why when I get up here, I show all these scriptures on, on the verse. That's why I get up here and, I, and, and on, on the screen. That's why I, I, I quote scripture after scripture after scripture. Because look, it's not going to be a speech that's going to set you free. You don't need a motivational speech from, from a pastor. You need the word of God in your life. Because the word of God is living and is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It is able to pierce the bone and marrow to the very intentions of the heart to bring forth change in your life. It is the word of God that will set you free. And when we as Christians are not speaking the word of God and we are ashamed of the word of God and we will not talk about God or anything in our workplace then we are not speaking the truth and we've got people all around us that are in bondage that God put you in that workplace to set free 
with the truth of God's word and you haven't done it? Well, I don't know enough. I, I, I don't have Bible college degree. I don't have all this stuff. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. I don't have Bible college degree either. <laughs> I get up here and I do this every week. And you know what the bad part is? Y'all listen to me. <laughs> Without a degree. The degree isn't what qualifies you. It's the call that's in your life. And we've talked about this before. The Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, that all things are cast away, behold, everything has become new. And that since you have been reconciled to God, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. See, we love that part about being a new creature, but we forget that we just got called into ministry when we got called to be a new creature. And that ministry of reconciliation is for you to reconcile others to God. And so guess what? How would you like if I got up here and I'm getting, ready to prepare, I'm getting ready to preach a sermon. And I have no idea what I'm talking about. I'm just wondering. I'm just rambling off stuff. And some of y'all might think that's what I'm doing now. But it's not. I'm, 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 I'm getting somewhere with it. You know, the, you, you may think that that's, that's what, you, you know, that, that, that you're, not, you're not called to ministry and stuff. So you don't have to do that. But listen, if you understand that when you're a new creature in Christ, that you're called to ministry, then the same way that you want me to study for my sermons and stuff to get up here to preach, guess what you need to do? You need to be in this Word, studying it. There's so many people who say, I've never heard from God. Have you ever picked up your Bible? Have you ever read it? And guess what? You've heard from God. Why? John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. So when you hear Scripture, you are hearing from God. When you are sitting in a, in a, in a, in a sermon and you're hearing things that, that, that God is speaking to you, guess what? You may be hearing my voice, but I am speaking the words of God to you. You are hearing from God. You know another time when you're hearing from God and you might not even recognize it? When you're getting mad at somebody and you're in the middle of a, of, of a heated discussion. We'll call it that and won't call it an argument or whatever. You're, you're in the middle of a heated discussion and you're at this point where something pops in your mind and you've got this little voice inside of you saying, don't say it. Don't you, nope, don't, don't go there. Don't say that. That's wrong. And then you go ahead and you say it anyway. You know what that little voice was? That was the Holy Spirit telling you, don't say that. You've heard from God. And we just have to realize the ways that we have heard from God. And we, realize, we, we need to realize that, that because we have heard from God, because you have come and you're students and you're taking notes and you're being disciples of God's Word, then the Word of God is inside of you. And guess whose job it is to pull it out of you? It's the Holy Spirit's job. So you don't even know. There's even one place where they told him, he said, don't even worry about what you're going to say because in that moment, the Spirit of God will reveal it to you exactly what you need to say. How many of you have ever been in a situation talking to somebody? You had no clue what to tell them. And then all of a sudden, a sermon that you heard before or a scripture that you read before just came up and you remembered it at that point. And you're like, well, you know, I just thought of something. And you give them that, that thing and it's been exactly what they need to hear. Anybody ever had that before? You know what that was? That was the voice of God. So why are you afraid to speak the truth of God? You hear the voice of God. You've been equipped with the same tools and the same things that I have. The same Holy Spirit that lives in me lives in you. The same Bible that I read is the same one that you read. And the same way that the Holy Spirit teaches me and guides me in His Word, He'll do the same thing for you. And He will bring those things back to you. So step out. Speak the truth. We need to speak words of faith and not fear. We need to, to speak words. The next one, that the thing that the, the Holy Spirit does is He helps us to worship. We need to begin to speak words of worship and, and, and not worry. I think so many times, some of us, we, we get so caught up in how bad everything is that we forget to be worshipers of God. And I'm not even talking about just breaking out in the middle of the, I need you more in the middle of your office one day because things are going wrong. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I, you know, I'm, I'm just talking about in our everyday life, making sure that the words that we speak lift up and build up, not only others, but build up God. How many times have we been guilty of talking to other people and we're in church and we hear sermons and we're all fired up and excited and believe God's going to do something. 
And then later we go home and we face life and we're like, I don't think, I don't think my husband's ever going to get saved. I just don't think that, that God's going to heal this person because, uh, you know, it just hasn't happened yet. I, I don't think that, that my marriage can be restored. You know what you're speaking? Not words of worship. You're speaking words of fear. You're speaking words of, uh, of, of death to the situation. You're taking the same mouth that on Sunday confessed how great our God is and then to other people and to the situations, you're talking about how God can't even move in your situation. God wants us to be people that worship Him in spirit and in truth. You know how you worship God in truth? Instead of speaking all the negative situations and all the fear and all the doubt and all the worry, instead of speaking all of those things over your marriage and your health and and everything like that, you speak the Word of God over those things. You speak of the goodness of your God. I remember when we were in the middle of all the stuff with my daughter Zia and and all the, the battles and stuff, fighting for her life and just getting negative report after negative report. She's not going to be healed. She's, you know, she's going to die. This is wrong. If, if she does live, she's going to either have to have transfusions or be on shots or live in a bubble. I mean, there, there was nothing life-giving that the doctors were giving me. But there's a scripture in John chapter 11. And this is where Jesus was talking about Lazarus. And, and, you know, everybody's telling him, you got to go, you got to go. Lazarus is sick, you got to go. And Jesus said, no, nah, this sickness isn't going to end in death, but it's going to bring glory to God. And you know what? Every time I heard one of those doctor's reports, I went back to that scripture and I said, you know what? This sickness will not end in death, but it will bring glory to God. And here in 14 days, my little girl that said, they said she wouldn't live to be one turns eight. And she's perfectly healthy. Why? Because God's word said the sickness would not end in death, but it would bring glory to God. And I chose to speak words of worship and faith and trust in my God. And when you're in the middle of a situation like that, and everybody is looking for you to fall apart, but you're still talking about how good your God is and you're still talking about how faithful your God is and you're still talking about how God can move and they, and they see a joy and they see a peace and they, they see that in your life. That same type of words when, you, when you're speaking good things about God even in the middle of a battle, that is as much if not more words of worship to God as it is when you're in here on a Sunday morning singing one of these worship songs. Some of us need to begin to worship God in spirit, but also in truth. Line our lives up with words of worship. Be an encouragement to people. How many of you have ever been around somebody that the minute that they come, you could be so excited and God just did something in your life and you go tell them about it and then after talking to them for two minutes, you leave completely depressed because they done told you everything that didn't happen in their life and and they done made you feel guilty because something did happen in your life and then they start pointing out things that haven't happened yet in your life. Because they're trying to pull you down to to that level and try to pull you down into that pit of, of despair and everything. But how many of you have been around somebody that the minute that they walk in the room, it can be one of the most tense, stressful situations. And I mean, there's just life. They bring laughter. They bring joy. I mean, the, the atmosphere just completely changes. Because of the words and the way that they talk. Now let me ask you this question. Which one are you? Because I think if we're honest, the majority of us would say that the majority of the time, we're not the one that everybody is like, woohoo, they're coming. Things are good now. Because they are here. We're not the ones that they build strength off of. But guys, we should be. And if we're speaking words of worship which is what the Holy Spirit brings to us, and we're we're speaking encouragement and things, then 
in the middle of a dark situation and stuff in somebody else's life, they're going to come to the light. They're going to come to the one where they see joy. They're going to come to the one where they see peace. And then guess what? Your words of worship in the workplace, not beating them over the head with a Bible, but because they've seen it consistently in your life, has now opened a door for you to speak words of truth into their life to bring deliverance and freedom into their life. God wants to use us. God wants to use our words. But we have got to yield ourselves to the power of His Holy Spirit. And the third thing is this, and Aaron, if you want to come on up. The Holy Spirit teaches us what to say. Not only what to say, but also what not to say. Come on, in the first service, I got a bunch of oh my's right there. <laughs> and they were like, oh. Because sometimes, guys, it's not what you say that, that makes the difference. It's not what you say that's going to turn the situation around. It, 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 it's not what, what you uh, say that, that is going to bring peace and stuff. Sometimes it's what you don't say that allows peace to remain, that allows hope to remain, that allows encouragement to be there. I think we need to ask God for a, a, an anointing for silence sometimes. I think some of us in our marriages, our marriages would be a whole lot better if we would just, act, if we would just yield to that little voice. Look, that little voice, everybody wants to say, that's your conscience. Like they got some little cricket sitting on, you know, Jiminy Cricket sitting on their shoulder. Don't say that, don't say that. That's the Holy Spirit of God. That is God inside of you speaking to you and saying, don't say that. Don't go there. Don't, don't even bring it up. How many of you, you, you got her into a situation, you know you're getting ready to see somebody, you know, holidays are coming up, you know the in-laws are there, and you know that there's that elephant in the room, and you just make up your mind, I'm not going to say anything about it, I'm going to be quiet about it, I'm just going to take that, 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 that low road, and the minute you get into that convert, the minute you get into that room, you just blurt it all out, and here it comes, and, and then you got the whole holidays ruined, or the whole day ruined, because you you said something that you knew you weren't supposed to say. See, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants to anoint you with silence sometimes. I want to read you this scripture in Matthew 27. This is right before what we read in verses 13 and 14. This is when everybody's accusing Jesus and and the Sadducees and Caiaphas and, and all these people were, you know, saying all this stuff about Jesus, that he committed blasphemy and he did all of this. And, and Pilate just looks at Jesus and he says this. He says, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? Look, and he did not answer him with one regard to even a single charge. And so the governor was quite amazed. Jesus is being accused. Jesus is, they're lying about him. They're spitting at him. They're mocking him. They're, they're tearing him apart. They're, they're, you know, all this stuff. And Jesus doesn't defend himself. And I love the last phrase of that verse. It says, and then the governor was amazed. Let me tell you guys something. Sometimes... It's not going to be what you do say that amazes people. It's going to be what you don't say. When in the world's eyes and in everybody's opinion, you have every right to defend yourself. You have every right to strike back. You have every right to, to, to lash back out and, and to do things when you can just be like... And walk on. Let me ask you something. Does the lies that they say, does it change who you are? Does the hurtful things that they say, does now all of a sudden because somebody called you fat, ugly, stupid, uh, you know, uneducated, uh, you know, whatever, somebody called you something that you're not or accused you of something, does that change who you are? 
just because somebody said something. That's why Jesus didn't defend himself. Because he was completely secure in who he was. He didn't have to tell everybody, yeah, I'm the son of God. Y'all need to listen to me. Y'all, you know. He didn't have to do any of that. He knew who he was. He had already preached the messages. He would already lived the life. Now, he was just going to be silent. You see, it was the silence that brought the amazement. Guys, let me tell you, sometimes it's going to be what you don't say that people see that is going to actually point them to the cross of Jesus. You know, you're probably sitting there trying to figure out, well, you know, the series is called Lead Me to the Cross. Why are you talking about the tongue? It's because God wants to use our tongue to lead people to the cross. He wants us to speak His truth. He wants us to speak words of hope and, and worship and, 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 and build people up. And at sometimes He just wants us to do this. Sometimes He just wants you to be quiet. How do you know when the situation is? How do you know what to do at that time? The power of the Holy Spirit. You know, here's the thing. So many people, and I know we got people from all kinds of different denominational backgrounds and stuff. This is, you know, we're, we're just a melting pot of come how you are and let's just read the Bible and see what it says. And, 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 and let's build this together. You, some of you came from Baptist, Methodist, Church of God, Pentecostal. You know, some of you came from the Church of Satan, you know, heathens. I mean, you came from all kinds of backgrounds. Church of the Bar and, you know, clubs and, and all that stuff. We come from all kinds of different backgrounds. And I know that a lot of people have, when they hear the name, when they hear the word Holy Spirit, they start to cringe and they start to withdraw and they start to you know, start looking for snakes or something crazy to happen or, you know, a ghost, Casper the ghost to come sweeping through here or anything. It's not what God is like at all. It's not what the Holy Spirit is like at all. And there's one pastor that, that said, uh, he said, when I was getting ready to go into Bible college and, and, and start ministry and everything, and he was from kind of a conservative uh, church background, and they had a real conservative view as far as the Holy Spirit and stuff. And, and he said, what can you tell me about ministry? What can you tell me to do? And, and he looked at him and he said, avoid people who talk about the Holy Spirit. And he was like, okay. You know, or I'll stay away from them crazy people. Think about the Holy Spirit and talk about the Holy Spirit and stuff. And so he avoided that. And here's the problem. is because God is in heaven and Jesus is in heaven. The one that comes alongside us and is here with us day in and day out, guess who that is? That's the Holy Spirit. The one who is speaking to you, telling you to shut your mouth, guess who that is? That's the Holy Spirit. The one who takes your Bible and when you read it and something just jumps off the page and you're like, wow, I have never seen that before. That verse is so awesome. You want to know why you do that? It's because of the Holy Spirit in you. And see, if we are going to lead people to the cross, then we have got to yield control of our tongue to the Holy Spirit where he leads us when we need to speak the truth when we need to speak words of worship and words of hope and when we need to just don't say anything at all I believe there's people in here right now that the Holy Spirit is dealing with your heart inside as I'm speaking about watching your words and watching your mouth and stuff your heart is like bouncing inside of your chest and it's completely different let me tell you something that's the power of the Holy Spirit right now and what he's doing is he's trying to show you that you need a savior in your life. He's trying to tell you he wants to come alongside you and he wants to help you not only to get control of your tongue, but he wants to help you get control of your whole life. He wants to help you walk free from sin. He wants to help you walk free from addiction and from bondage and from drug and alcohol addiction, from pornography, from, from, from promiscuity, from, from, from hatred and bitterness and, and from all of these different types of background. The, the, the Holy Spirit wants you to know that he is able to touch you right now and if you will allow him to come into your life and, and move in your life, 
life that the same verse that I quoted earlier about that if any man be in Christ he is a new creature behold all things are, 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 are washed away and everything has been made new God is sending his Holy Spirit to deal with you right now to tell you I want to make you new I don't want you to go back to the same old lifestyle I don't want you to struggle in the way that you have I want to set you free because you've heard the word of truth and you want to experience that freedom I want to do this real quick. I want everybody to bow their head. I don't want you to look around. And I'm not going to draw this out real long. But if that's you, and you know the Holy Spirit is dealing with you, and you want to turn your life over to Him right now, and you want to get on the, the road and give Him control of your life, I want you to slip your hand up, and you can put it right back down. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see the hand in the back. I see the hand over there. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, don't, don't worry about what the person's thinking. I see that hand over there. Don't worry about what anybody else. You know what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now. He's showing you that you need a Savior. He's showing you that's you. I'm going to wait one more minute. Is there anybody else that, 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 that God is doing that? All right, let's do this. Let's all stand to our feet. And now, here's where we get to use our tongue. In Romans, it says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you can be saved. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And when you, when you say this prayer, it's, it's not the words of the prayer. It's the confession of the heart that you're saying, I believe that the cross of Jesus was for me. I believe that Jesus died on that cross so that I can live a life of freedom, that I can walk victoriously. And I want that life, and I want to give my life to Him. And that's what it is. You're confessing Jesus as Lord, and you are putting your hope in Him and giving control of your life. I want to lead you in that prayer. And I want everybody, I want y'all to just say this prayer with me. If you're, if you're already saved, you, you're not going to get unsaved because you said the prayer again or anything crazy like that. You, you will still be saved again. You might even give you a little bit of extra assurance, you know, about, about doing it. But I want you to do this because we're all going to use our tongue to help people find the cross this morning. Amen. Come on, let's pray. Say, so, dear Jesus, I need you in my life. I believe you died for my sins. And I want you to forgive me of my sins. I have messed up. I have not done things your way. But I want to change. Come into my life and change me. I give you my life today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I just come to you right now. If you, if you know you have a problem with your mouth and, and, and controlling your mouth and saying things and stuff, and, and I'm, I'm just going to begin to just pray over you. And if you want to raise your hands and, and just kind of receive that and, and stuff, you can. Father, I just come to you right now. Father, I just pray for every person in here, God. God, I pray that we are a church, Father, who we line our lives up with your word, God. I pray that we are a church, Father, that we, we, we give your, your Holy Spirit reign and, and over our mouth and our words, God. God, I pray, Father, that you would just uh, let us to speak truth, God. Lord, I pray that we will, we will not speak cursings and, and things, but, God, we will speak blessing. God, that we don't have salt and, and, and bitter water and, and, and fresh water, but, God, I pray that our mouths will be a, a fresh source of life, of encouragement, of love, of grace, of mercy, and of truth, God. God, that at times when we need to confront sin, that we would confront it, but we don't confront it with opinion, but we confront it with your truth, God. Lord, we give you control of our mouth. Come on, right where you are, say, Holy Spirit, I give you control of my mouth. May you use it to build others up and not tear them down. May you use it to bring glory to your name and not a reproach to your name. May you use my tongue to lead others to the cross. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, church, let's give our God a hand clap of praise.